there is a great problem with people being put out of work because of the industrial revolution. All kinds of industries are collapsing, driving people out of the country into the cities to get whatever jobs they can. That is not working well for families. It's not working well for society in general, even in North America. Welcome to this very special episode of 18th Century Cooking. Today we're going to be talking about the poor and how to feed the poor in this time period of the 18th century and specifically the 1790s and about 1800. In this time period, uh, there is a, a real problem with supplying just normal people with bread. Uh, there's a crop failure in the late 1790s in Great Britain and there's a, a great problem with feeding just everyday common people on the street. There are bread riots, there are all sorts of things, and there's a, a desire within all of the society to fix this problem, and many people wrote about it. We have this wonderful little piece uh, from Hannah Moore, and she writes this small little pamphlety book called The Cottage Cook. So Ryan's been cooking up this soup out of this book. Let me read to you the recipe. So you think that this book is actually a cookbook. Now, it does have recipes in it, but it's only got like four recipes, and they're all almost the same thing. Let me read to you recipe number three. That's the one we're making today. Take two pounds of salt beef or pork, cut it into very small bits, and put it into a pot with six quarts of water and let it boil on a slow fire for three quarters of an hour, and then put a few carrots, parsnips or turnips, all cut small, or a few potatoes sliced, a cabbage, or a couple of cresses. Thicken the whole with a pint of oatmeal, all of these to be well seasoned with salt and pepper. The other recipes are actually almost exactly the same thing in this cookbook. And this type of recipe is mentioned over and over in this time period. Why? There's no bread in this. There's no grain that needs to be um, you know, given to this particular situation. The poor in the late 18th century, they survived on bread and small beer. That's it. And there was this, since uh, wheat was so expensive, they had to come up with other means. And these people in the upper parts of society said, how can we help the poor people eat? How can we give them different options for eating bread? There were other options for bread specifically, and they talked about these in the time period, making bread with other things than wheat, making bread with rye, making bread with uh, oats or barley or even peas and beans, making bread that was not very good, um, very, very, well, even distasteful. And the common people rejected that bread. They did not want to eat it. They wanted to eat white bread. So let's set the stage for what's happening in the late 18th century in Great Britain. Uh, there is a great problem with the uh, Industrial Revolution. is basically coming into this time period and a lot of people are being thrown out of work. Uh, a lot of cottage industries like weaving and spinning are being taken up by machines and people are leaving the countryside and they are going to the cities and it's a, there's a great increase in low-income people in these urban situations. And then we have on top of that all these crop failures and other problems. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a great amount of stress on lower income people here in Great Britain and even in North America in this time period. There's also a great desire to have people not cook their food the wrong way. So even during the Revolutionary War and in this time period, there's a desire that if people get meat, they should not roast it. Uh, they shouldn't uh, fry it on the fire, but in fact, make soup with it because it's the most efficient way to get the, the most nutrition out of a piece of meat. So this is from uh, The Soldier's Friend. And this is a little pamphlet right here from the time period, 1798. And it's for officers to help uh, their their uh, military soldiers under their command eat properly and m many other things. He says, nothing is so agreeable and at the same time so wholesome to a soldier after a fatiguing and perhaps a wet march as some warm soup. 
To boil the meat is therefore the mode of cooking which ought to be the most generally used in the army. There's even almost commands from the upper parts of the military down to the lower officers telling them to not let their soldiers fry the meat, that you should only give them the equipment so that they can boil the meat or they can make soups and stews because it's the most efficient way to feed these soldiers. In this late 18th century time period, there's also the creation of soup kitchens, or as they call them in this book, soup shops that are popping up in London and they, they want to be able to feed poor people. They don't necessarily give away the soup, they charge a small amount for it, and the amount that they isn't covered by what they're charged is actually covered by a subscription by other people in that community. But they're reaching out. They want to feed as many people as possible. And we've got this wonderful recipe for uh, this soup kitchen in Birmingham. This is out, outside of London, obviously. Um, 80 pounds of beef, shoulder, bosom, sticking pieces with three oxes melts or lungs uh, given in by the butchers and weighing about 16 pounds. So something like 96 pounds of meat. Also, four legs of beef weighing 34 pounds, three ox cheeks weighing 27 pounds, and then added to that, 37 quarts of white peas, 21 pounds of onions, 48 pounds of ground rice, 12 pounds of salt, six ounces of black pepper, two ounces of ground ginger, and just a half ounce of cayenne pepper. Uh, also, mint, celery, carrots, or leeks are often given as presents. Uh, to sort of fill out this. Now, they would make these huge batches. Um, this batch here would make 160 gallons of soup. And they, they go through and give you exactly what it would cost to make this 160 pounds or 160 gallons of soup. I, I, even a, a recipe like this isn't interesting that in 160 gallons, they still put in the spices like a half ounce of cayenne. They want these, they, they still want there to be some flavor in this basically very inexpensive watery soup. And they would sell, or somebody would sort of buy a subscription to this uh, for a small amount. Each week, each day, they could come in and get, say, a half a gallon of soup and feed their entire family. Maybe there would be some uh, liquid allowance to this too, either small beer or something like it, and possibly a small loaf of bread. And so in the cities, people could still eat well, even for a very small amount of money. A great example of someone in this time period is the author of this cottage cook, which is Hannah Moore. And she's writing hundreds of small pamphlets, uh, helping out people with different ideas. Uh, sometimes they're moralistic teachings, sometimes they have a religious bent to them, but she has a real heart for what's happening with these uh, people in the lower part of society. She will want, really wants to help them out as best she can. And the whole beginning part of this is a, is a little story about a woman who didn't feel like she had enough money to really help out people. And Hannah Moore kind of goes through this, the steps of, of what somebody can do, even if they don't have a lot of funds. They can really help people out by teaching them how to cook or teaching them other things. So there's a, a lot going on in this time period. The, the people in the upper parts of society aren't necessarily saying, oh, poor people, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. They definitely want to reach down and help out the poorer parts of society right here in the late 18th century. Definitely probably a change from what was happening earlier on in the 18th century. So let me read to you this little section from The Cottage Cook or showing the way to do much with little money right here at the end of the main story. Uh, she's talking to someone and she says, you have taught me that much good may be done with a little money and that the heart and the head and the hands are of some use as well as the purse. 
So there's Mrs. Jones in this story, uh, learning about what she can do. And again, if, I mean, you can almost uh, connect right back with the Christmas Carol and Scrooge. There was Scrooge and he was very, very well to do. He wasn't really doing anything with his money, but he had a lot of money. Uh, people came to him and said, hey, how can you help out the poor? And he asks immediately, what about the workhouses? What about the poor houses? Aren't they doing uh, the right thing? And here in this book, they're definitely saying, how can we help out the poor without sending them to those very places? The poor house, the workhouse in the late 18th century England were very, very difficult places. They made them that way on purpose. They didn't want people to stay there. Uh, they didn't want people to live in the poor house forever. And so they made it a very, very dismal existence. This, these works are meant to keep people out of those very places. How can we help out the poor? So here it is, the soup right out of the Cottage Cook. Ryan, what did you think about the recipe? It's really straightforward, it's really simple. Uh, there were a lot of root vegetables that you could use and I just decided to use them all because right. we have them all. So. A little bit of everything. Yeah, right. Also, I mean, I think the special thing is the oatmeal that comes in at the end. Right, that thickens, thickens it right it up. up. Right. Yep. I wouldn't complain about this no. anytime. It's interesting. The texture is almost like when you thicken something with flour. Right. The oatmeal does an excellent job of thickening this up so that it isn't a, a super thin uh, soup. Right. One of the references actually complained. The the uh, I think it was the College of S uh, Physicians. Okay. They were saying, oh, you know, a liquid food doesn't uh, doesn't work in your stomach. They said, oh, the stomach acids turn it into solids and only then can you digest it, which now, of course, we think is pretty silly. Yes. But this thickening of the soup was an important part of that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely hearty. There's a lot going on in here. So it's got carrots, it's got turnips. I think the parsnips really come through, that sweetness from the parsnips. Yeah. And then there's really only, I mean, compared to everything else, there's only a little bit of meat. True. But you cut it small enough that it, you know, it fills it out. Yeah, so. that's the whole idea of cut it really small. Right. Uh, in that particular recipe, it talked about salt beef. You used fresh beef, which is fine, yeah. uh, but salt beef would have been an inexpensive meat that they could have gotten any time of the year. I think when you cut the cabbage up really small, mm. that really helps to fill it up too. You, like, you never have a bite that feels empty or brothy, right? There's always something there. But it's not all greens. You have this, right. if you have the big pieces of greens in there, you know, it's hard to work around. Uh, but in this way, it fills it up. It gives you the nutrition of the greens without the troublesome right. big leaves in there. Plus the greens, the, you really don't, it's not like a beef broth. This is like a vegetable, it tastes like a vegetable broth. Mm -hmm. There's enough uh, cabbage and the parsnips and the carrots really coming through. And then there's body from the potatoes. It's just good overall. So I read that giant recipe from the soup kitchen one, right? Yep. With the 80 pounds. The, their instructions were to actually cook those meats in a digester or pressure cooker so that it turned everything into a broth. I am so glad we tried this recipe. It has an amazingly rich history, an important history. Let me read to you the final paragraphs from the cottage cook. This is the friendly hints at the very end. The difference between eating bread new and stale is one loaf in five. If you turn your meat into broth, it will go much further than if you roast it or bake it. If you have a garden, make the most of it. A bit of a leek or an onion makes all dishes savory at small expense. If the money spent on fresh butter were spent on meat, poor families would be much better fed than they are. If money spent on tea were spent on home-brewed beer, the wife would be better fed, the husband better pleased, and both would be healthier. Keep a little scotch barley, rice, dried peas, and oatmeal in the house. They are all cheap 
and don't spoil. Keep also pepper and ginger. Pay your debts, serve God, love your neighbor, the end. If you want more information on the lives of the poor, check out this episode.